This is the last installment of biochemistry notes, and we are going to focus on a particular kind of one of the macromolecules. And in this case, it's going to be a special kind of protein, okay? Now, your bell work question should have already been answered. And it has to, and the answer is pretty much on this slide. So make sure that you have gotten that down. If you missed it, you're gonna have to get it from a neighbor or come back to this in the future. So we're on slide two and um, we're gonna be talking about these special proteins. Now, we have been discussing biochemical reactions like synthesis and hydrolysis when it comes to making polymers from monomers or turning polymers into monomers. So these require oftentimes these synthesis and hydrolysis reactions, they require special helpers called enzymes. In other words, they really, these, these reactions wouldn't happen at the speed that we need them to happen in life or at the, in the amounts that we need if enzymes weren't there. And I already said that enzymes are proteins, <clears throat> special proteins, that act as something called biological catalysts. So a catalyst is, well, hold on, I jumped the gun. Since they are proteins, their building blocks are amino acids. So the building blocks of enzymes are amino acids. You might be asked a question on a future test, not something as simple as what is the building block of a protein, but what is the building block of an enzyme? And you have to know that enzymes are proteins and therefore amino acids are the building blocks, the tiny monomers. You know, the ones with the R groups that change them. So what is a catalyst? A catalyst is any substance that increases the rate of a chemical reaction without itself being used up in the chemical reaction. So, Catalysts take part in, but don't get used up in a reaction. They are left over at the end. So here's an example. This reaction takes place in your blood when carbon dioxide needs to be transported from the cells back to the lungs and breathed out as a waste product. So how does the blood do this? How does the body do this? Well, it uses something, an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. So it combines carb, carbon dioxide, the waste product from cellular respiration in your cells. It combines it with water. So your body needs water to get rid of waste. And it makes carbonic acid. <clears throat> so by itself, this reaction produces about, so make sure you label that carbonic acid in your notes, it produces about 200 molecules of carbonic acid per hour. And in the presence of the enzyme, carbonic anhydrase, 600,000 molecules of carbonic acid form every second. That's a 10 million time increase. So what, you're, what, you're, what I'm trying to say on this slide here, folks, is that we would not be able to process our waste out of our body, out of our cells, nearly fast enough 
to survive without an enzyme, without a helper molecule to speed up the rate of these reactions in the blood. Okay? That's just one example of many examples that are happening inside uh, an animal's body. So why, why is the enzyme, we're on slide four, why is the enzyme written above the arrow and not as part of the reactant? So on that last slide and on this slide too, you see that the carbonic anhydrase is not written here. It's not written in the reactants and it's not written in the products. It's written above the arrow. And that's because the enzyme is the helper. It doesn't actually take place in the reaction. I said that before. So this is just a, a reminder, a refresher. So in the future, if you ever are required to write an enzymatic reaction, you know that the enzyme goes over the arrow, not on the reactant side. That's the left side or the product side. That's the right side, okay? And you can see here, these are substances that need to be joined together and they won't do it because they're floating around and bouncing off of each other. But when the enzyme comes in, they fit right in and boom, the enzyme just finishes, finishes the job really fast. And then it can be used again for the next ones that come in. So here are some examples of enzymes that you might be familiar with. <clears throat> saliva. I believe that you're familiar with saliva. Um, it contains an enzyme called amylase to start breaking down food right away. That's why you should chew your food very well so um, you, your body can digest it better. Lactase is the second one. This enzyme helps break down the sugars in milk called lactose. You may have heard of people being lactose intolerant. They can't have dairy products because they get an upset tummy. Well, um, that's because their bodies um, lack, no pun intended, lack the enzyme lactase to break down lactose and so your body doesn't digest it well and things don't feel good <laughs> uh, but you can you can take lactase uh, as a pill if you wanted to eat some pizza or ice cream for you know on, on, on occasion and your that will enable your body to have the enzyme to break it down it's pretty neat um, bioluminescence if you've ever been up north in the mountains or in the woods or you know New York or somewhere up there or in the you know Appalachian Smoky Mountains, at night, you you know as soon as the sun sets, you will see the lightning bugs or fireflies, as some people call them. I grew up calling them lightning bugs. So here's a little blinking lightning bug right there. Okay, zoom in on that for you. And there is bacteria that live in the lightning bug's butt that use the enzyme luciferase. Lucifer means light, okay? Um, to break down molecules and release energy in the form of light, okay? And then there's crying and onions. Now the onion itself is not crying, so to speak, like the, that little animation is showing, but an, enz um, an onion has a very special chemical weapon to protect itself from being chomped upon by animals. Now, humans are weird animals. We like that, that bite that onions give us when we put them on hamburgers or we cook them and put them in our soups and things like that. Onions have a particular flavor that we like. But imagine perhaps a cow or some animal in the wild digging up an onion in, in, in the wild, right? and it bites into the onion. Well, it's gonna get an enzyme and another substance, which we haven't just um, defined yet, called a substrate. Normally separate in the onion, they combine, as soon as the onion is damaged, 
either by a knife or by a, a chomping animal, um, re to release this chemical weapon that will stop you from eating any more of it. It's really interesting. <clears throat> and you know that chemical weapon works when you start cutting into an onion and, and you just, you're crying and your eyes burn. All right, what are some characteristics of enzymes? We're on slide six. So each type of enzyme will act on only one specific material for which it's designed. It's, you have to think of it as a lock and key. So this is like an analogy, the lock and key. So the lock is the enzyme and the key is the substrate. Okay, so if you look here, the orange is the enzymes. They're very specific shapes. And these are the substrates, the other molecules that need to be bound together or broken apart, one or the other, depending upon whether it's synthesis or hydrolysis, right? Um, synthesis is making, hydrolysis is breaking. Remember that. So like all proteins, each enzyme has a specific shape, like I just said, determined by its unique sequence of, and it's a protein, so sequence of amino acids. We talked about that when we defined amino acids. And the organisms, all different organisms, produce different enzymes for different reactions in the body. Plants, different kinds of animals, sea creatures, a lion, Okay, which is very similar to us. They wouldn't need too many different things than we would. So enzymes can be reused because they don't change during the chemical reaction. Remember, they're not used up. That's why they're written above the arrow. And the active site of an enzyme is the specific part of an enzyme that fits with the substrate. Enzymes are specific. So here is the enzyme with its active site. This side is not active. Here is your substrate coming in, perfect fit, lock and key. The enzyme can often change its shape slightly. We'll talk about that later. To fit the substrate as it binds. Then you've got this complex, which is both of them. It performs the reaction, and then you've got the products, and then the enzyme ready to go again. You know, the, the cycle starts over again and the new ones come, the new substrate comes in. The thing needing to be reacted on. Now, in order for an enzyme to, sorry, in, sorry, in order for a reaction to happen, you, requires, you require some energy. It requires a, a certain amount of energy. And that energy is called activation energy. And it's the energy, like I said, needed to start a chemical reaction. <coughs> So I want you to pay very close attention, stop writing for a second, pay very close attention to this uh, animation here, okay? So it starts here. Normally, you have to go up to the top and require that much energy in order for bonds to be broken or made. But if you add a catalyst, it changes the energy, that's that, that's that delta H right there. It lowers it, the activation energy, so that the process can happen at a much faster rate. And you can see the difference between the two when you have a catalyst and a, and a non-catalyst, okay? So that's how, that's what en enzymes do to reaction rates. They, they, they cause them to have, need less energy to happen. And so it's quick and precise. Life, life requires quick and precise, and that's what enzymes do. They make it quick and precise. They make that energy barrier be able to be overcome faster or with less energy. Okay, so enzymes lower that activation energy to, by creating conditions um, that lower the energy. Okay needed to start the reaction. So enzymes are very important protein tools for making things happen in the body. All right, so let's take a look at this. This is very similar to what I just showed you, but um, in just a still form, all right? 
So what you're going to do, don't worry about this Gibbs free energy thing. That's not something we have to know. We just have to know energy. Okay, so you can, we just delete that Gibbs free thing right there. If that's in your notes, just cross that out because that's just going to confuse you. Just put energy, activation energy. Maybe rename it activation energy, okay? So you're going to label this no enzyme and enzyme in your notes. <clears throat> Without an enzyme, much more energy is needed. With an enzyme, much less activation energy to catalyze that reaction, to, to make that action that, that happen. And the animation on the bottom, I don't know what's going on there. It's supposed to be some guy throwing a rock over, a, pushing a rock up over the hill. So I guess you could imagine if, um, if you added an enzyme to his pushing a rock, maybe a shovel or something where he could reduce the size of the hill, then his job of pushing a rock over the hill would be easier. Okay, just an analogy. All right, so how do enzymes work? We're on slide 10. Enzymes can take molecules apart, remember what that's called, hydrolysis, right? Or they can put smaller molecules together to make, remember what make is, the word make is synthesis. So to make is synthesis, to break is hydrolysis. Make, synthesis, break, hydrolysis. Say it seven times and you never forget it. Make, synthesis, break, hydrolysis. Okay? And here's a hydrolysis reaction. So the, you've got this bond here that needs to be broken, but it can't do it fast enough for the body. So it sends in an enzyme. It binds to the activation site. I think there's a couple of things, or at least one thing right there that you have to fill in yourself on your notes. Um, and then you've got the substrate enzyme complex. And the binding um, places stress on that bond and breaks it. And so in this case, um, the substrate was, uh, you could tell by the shape that it's a, a carbohydrate, right? A, sac a disaccharide. This is pretty much sucrose. This is um, table sugar. This is what you put, you know, use for baking and sprinkle into your, onto your cereal or whatever, or your oatmeal, okay, or whatever you use sugar in the kitchen for. That's, that's it. And then uh, this is what your body does. Your body brings in this enzyme to break this down into things your body can use, which is now it's free. The enzyme, once it releases the glucose and fructose, the monosaccharides, right, the simple sugars, it, uh, it's free to continue on and keep working and do it again and again and again. And here's, so that was a hydrolysis. That was breaking, right? Hydrolysis reaction. Here's synthesis, making. So in a synthesis reaction, you've got the, the substrates, which are separate now. The enzyme, which is fit like a lock and key. Then you've got the substrate complex. You have to label all these things in your notes. So active site, substrates, enzyme, the enzyme substrate complex. Now the enzyme being able to be reused, unchanged, and then the product. Okay, so, um, which is the new, now in this case, uh, some, some disaccharide or a sac saccharide or dipeptide or um, something like that. Synthesis, it made something, it made a bond, it didn't break a bond. Okay, induced fit. What is induced fit? Just take a look at this right now, okay? I'm gonna zoom in on this. What's happening here? You've got the substrate, the purple thing, and the enzyme, the yellow thing, or orange thing. Take a look really close at what's happening at the binding site. Okay, the enzyme is changing its shape so that it can more properly accept the substrate. It's still the right shape, but not quite, okay? So that's what induced fit means. Induced fit means that the enzyme grasps the substrate to give a, a, a tight fit. It's kind of like a handshake, where your hands aren't normally that shape until they squeeze each other. 
and the purpose is to make the reaction occur more, more likely to occur if you've got a tighter fit. It's kind of like uh, a wrench and a nut, okay? Where you put the wrench on the nut and if the wrench is too big, it's gonna slip and the nut's not going to loosen. Or if it's too tight, it's not gonna fit at all. But it's more like a slip, it's more like it's too big. And so what occurs? Hydrolysis, the bonds are strained, so it's going to break the bonds. And in synthesis, the molecules are brought tighter together. Okay, and obviously that picture on the bottom that says synthesis or hydrolysis, we know that that is synthesis because you're making, you're taking separates and making one rather than having one and making separates, okay? So that's what induced fit means. Now what's a coenzyme? Oh boy, Mr. King, now you're really, now you're really asking for a lot. Enzymes and substrates, now you got this thing called a coenzyme. Well, a coenzyme is not an enzyme because it's not a protein, right? Now, not all proteins are enzymes, don't get me wrong, but enzymes are. So this can't be an enzyme, we have to call it something else. And co kind of means like it's a helper, right? But they're still organic. They're not proteins, but they're still organic, which means they're made of carbon and hydrogen and such. And they help enzymes to grasp the substrate. So the coenzymes are needed for induced fit. Vitamins are examples of coenzymes. We need to eat the proper amount of foods, not amount, I guess, but types of foods, so that we don't get a vitamin deficiency, which is essentially um, malnutrition. You're not getting the things you need, so you can suffer. In the past, for example, and I guess with modern times in um, very poor countries. Um, in the past, though, I'll go on the past example. Sh um, sailors on ships were out at sea for too long and they ran out of certain kinds of food. Food particularly rich in vitamin C, which we get, you know, from oranges and other citrus fruits, but we also get vitamin C from other foods as well. And when you, when you are deficient in vitamin C, you get something called scurvy, which is a very nasty um, vitamin deficiency. So a cofactor, they, they were lacking a cofactor to help do things in their body, all right? And um, metals are also an example like zinc and iron, you need these things in your food and they help increase the rate of reaction. So here you have your enzyme, here you have a substrate, but this is not the right shape for that substrate. So you need this helper, this coenzyme that comes in, makes the shape correct, and now you can get induced fit and um, it'll help. See, cofactors and enzymes help together to make the substrate fit properly. All right, so how do we name enzymes? Enzymes always, almost, I think almost always, um, end in ACE, A-S-E. You'll notice earlier in the notes, I had the, and it's still in your notes, I had the um, ends bold and italicized, okay? And that was to show you that all of the enzymes end in ACE, for the most part. So maltase, what would maltase, what would its substrate be? What would maltase affect? Now we learned about maltose. Um, lipids, lipase, you're getting a, a pattern here, you're seeing the pattern. The, Ose is a sugar, for example, but malt and malt, ACE tells you that it's the enzyme that breaks down the sugar. ACE, lip or lipe, lipid. Lipase breaks down fats. Protease breaks down, come on, you can do it, prot proteins, all right? What is lactose? 
the substrate of? What breaks, what enzyme would break down lactose? It was in our notes earlier, so you should say lactase. Now, amylase is the one in your spit. This one's a little tricky because the substrate doesn't have an OS name. Um, it, it might actually, like, but we know it as long, very long chains of uh, glucose molecules that are found in things like rice and potatoes and bread. So if you're thinking starch, then you are correct. Amylase is in your spit, I said before. And if you were to chew on something that was starchy, like any of those things I just said, um, like a french fry or something like that, the, animal, the, the spit in your saliva, sorry, your saliva is spit, ha, huh, the enzyme in your saliva called amylase starts to break those bonds in the starch down right before, right even bef as soon as you put it in your mouth, you know, before you even swallow it, your body is uh, chemically breaking down those bonds. All right, time to test yourself really quick. Slide 15, 15 and 16. Um, they give you the enzyme, which we just did. So this one should be pretty easy if you were paying attention. Wake up back there. So you've got starch and you put it in your mouth and you chew it up and then it breaks down into sugars. The substrate is starch, obviously. Okay, let's try these though. You have lipase, which is the ACE means it's the enzyme. There's gonna be questions like this on your test. Which of the following is an enzyme? And all you gotta do is look for the ACE. You don't even have to know, have ever seen it before in your life. But if it has ACE on the end, you know it's an enzyme. So you've got fats and you add lipase and you water and you get the broken up glycerol and the fatty acids. And obviously it, the substrate is going to be fats, okay? or you could have said lipids. And then protease, come on, it's obvious right now, it's just very simple, protein, right? Breaks up the proteins into um, its amino acids. All right, so factors affecting enzymes, temperature, uh, pH, and concentration. In other words, how densely packed the um, molecules are in there. If there's, um, more, it's going to go faster. If there's less, it's going to go slower. If you change the pH from acidic to basic or less neutral or more neutral, you know, remember closer to seven, that's going to affect the, how the enzymes uh, react, uh, you know, their ability to react. And then of course, um, temperature. So temperature, um, higher temperature or lower temperature will affect the rate of enzyme reaction, enzyme uh, ability to react, okay? So there's something called enzyme denaturation or denaturation. And this is, look at the, break the word up, break up denaturation to denature or to change the natural shape of it. So the shape of an enzyme is critical, right? Like a lock and key. If I took a key and I struck it with a hammer, well, it's not going to fit that lock anymore, right? And that's what we're looking at here. So the thing, so if I, so imagine that hammer is temperature, pH, or concentration, that's going to affect the ability of the enzyme. Look at the picture. I put this picture in your notes um, to, to function properly. Certainly the one, the denatured one on the bottom of this picture is not the same shape. Similar, but not the same shape as the functioning one, okay? So the environmental conditions can alter the shape. And that's called denaturization, denaturation, denaturation, the sorry, denaturation. I said it differently again, didn't I? Denaturation. Denaturation, denaturation, tomato, tomato, I don't care. As long as you get it right on the test and you, you, you understand the concept. So two environmental conditions are temperature and pH, like we said before. So we're going to talk about what this looks like graphically, like on a graph, okay? So temperature and pH, two environmental conditions 
and you can just write temp and pH. Make sure you write pH properly. A lot of you I've seen on your papers, you're writing P as a capital P and a lowercase h or both lowercase. Please make sure it's a lowercase p and a capital H. All right, so how do we read enzyme graphs? Check, take a look at this first graph. And I put these in your notes. We're on slide uh, 19. So you can see, obviously, it's clear that as the temperature goes up, you reach what's called an optimum temperature. And then at, at a certain point, the rate of reactivity just drops, plummets. So when you're up here, no good. When you're down here, no good. But when you, or, you know, the closer you get to that perfect environment, it's like the Goldilocks zone, right? This porridge is too cold. This porridge is too hot. This porridge is just right, okay? That's what we're looking for here. So as the temperature increases, the substrate and the mo enzyme molecules move more quickly, and they collide more often. The rate of reaction increases. So as the temperature goes up, the rate of reaction increases until you get to its optimum or best temperature for enzyme activity. But then as the temperature goes above the optimum, the enzyme starts to denature. It changes its shape and no longer fit with the enzyme or um, that should say no longer fit with the substrate. Fix that in your notes right there, kids, okay? The enzyme doesn't fit with an enzyme. It fits with a substrate. Typo, you all heard me? Change that in your notes to substrate. So the reaction rate decreases. It goes down. So here's some questions you're going to answer. <clears throat> In your notes, I'm not going to show you the answers. You're going to do these by yourself. You can do these at the end of the period. Um, this is slide 20, so we only have a few slides left. And they're all questions like this. They're all uh, graph questions, different kinds of things. So just the first one, you have to circle the right answer. Um, at what temperature does enzyme activity greatest? What's the optimum temperature? And so on and so forth. So you're going to read the graph, and you are going to answer the questions. You're going to work with a partner. If you have any, if you guys can't figure it out, of course, um, ask Mr. Keen, okay? All right, so the graph two, we're on slide, there's no slide number, 21, I guess. Um, pH is the measure of how acidic or basic a substance is. And that's obvious, we know that. We have we've, we we learned we were supposed to have learned about pH um, in the previous unit. So you can see it's the same thing as temperature. Once you reach, once you increase the pH, you're going to get to that perfect Goldilocks zone, and then when you continue, it's going to drop off. Okay, it's going to denature the enzyme. All right, so. You're gonna do the same thing with this graph. You're going to answer the two questions and, um, and then move on to the next. And um, this is for specific um, substrates called pepsin and pancreatic, pancreatic lipase. Okay, well the lipase is uh, these are enzymes, not substrates, right? So pepsin is an enzyme that digests protein into amino acids in the stomach. Anything with peps or pepsic refers to the stomach. That's why you take Pepto-Bismol, um, because that refers to the stomach. So again, you're gonna read this graph. What is the optimum pH for pepsin? What is the optimum, and so on and so forth, and answer those questions later. And it continues on the next slide, slide 24. These questions are all in your notes as well as that graph. So continue to work at the end of those notes with your partner. All right, now we're on graph four, which is slide 25. I told you it was, it was gonna be fast at this point. Um, so this is concentrations. We talked about temperature, we talked about pH. Now we're talking about concentration. In other words, how much is in there, concentration. You can see this picture here. 
you you've got um, one substrate and or two actually, and then here you increase the substrate. But here all of the enzymes are busy, so adding more substrate is not going to change the rate if all of the enzymes are busy. At a at a point, adding more substrate just levels off. Okay, so it increases at first, that's your notes here, but then it levels off after a while because nothing, you can't go any faster. <clears throat> that's like at the DMV. You guys uh, should be visiting the DMV soon, or if not already, you're getting your learner's permits. And the DMV, there's only so many DMV workers, right? So these are the enzymes of the DMV workers, and this is you. You got there early, so you get a, a worker right away. But now you come in later, and now you're sitting in all those chairs waiting, or at a doctor's office. I guess you could say the same thing. There's only so many doctors, and you, now you've got patients all waiting in the waiting room, and there's only so many doctors that can see the patients. So no, you can keep adding patients. It's not going to speed the doctors up, right? And that's what this is about. That's what substrate concentration is about, Okay. The, the enzyme, the doctor, the DMV worker is occupied. You, adding more does not speed it up. It just, if anything, it slows it down. But that's, no, that's um, not what happens in, uh, doesn't slow down in enzymes. Okay. Okay, so some questions here about that. And you, this picture is in your notes, so please use it to answer those questions. Work with your partners later, very soon. Okay. And then the final one is, this is the last slide, um, slide 27, and this is enzyme concentration. So it's exactly the same result as substrate concentration. It doesn't matter. So if I have, yeah, it, it, it's the same exact thing. As more enzymes added at first, it's going to increase. But then the reaction levels off when all the substrates being worked on by enzymes. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter how much more enzyme I add. It just increasing the concentration does not affect the rate. Continuing to add more does not affect the rate. And that is the end of our notes. Hopefully you, I believe that's the last slide. Yeah. So spend the rest of the time going over those graphs and other questions in your notes to make sure that um, you're good.